Dan Mueller. Hey, what's up? This is Jeff Yerhaken, and welcome to the Punk Rock Chronicles podcast. In this podcast, we talk about things all punk rock with the people that live it, and today we have got a very special guest. Hey, what's up? <laughs> and his name is Mike McGran from Channel 3. How you doing? Pleasure to be here, guys. Yeah, we're definitely stoked to have you on the podcast. He was the forming member of Channel 3, which is an awesome punk rock band from Cerritos, California. Yep, Cerritos. And uh, why don't we get started here? Why don't we talk about how you originally got into punk rock music? Yo, punk rock, um, you know, the other member of Channel 3, of course, Kim Gardner. And we've been friends since second grade. Cerrito, wow. Cerritos was like a you know, brand new suburban community and, you know, just flooded with young kids back in like the 70s. And uh, Kim and I met in elementary school. And I'd have to credit his great musical taste for guiding me through the 70s because he and his... Older brothers and sisters, you know, were always into, you know, besides the usual crap is, is uh, you know, David Bowie and sure. T-Rex and all that things. And then naturally when we started going to shows, you know, we were, were more interested in going, you know, to the whiskey than all the arena rock and all that. Right, right. So what kind of bands would you go see? like? In well, you know, it, it's funny. But back then, you know, you'd go see a band, the whiskey, and you'd see a band like, the, you know, the Weasels opening up or, you know, you know, punk, you know, the Dogs from Detroit. And you could tell this was something different. You know, they were, you know, faster, edgier songs, sometimes without a guitar solo. And that was just mind-blowing back then in context. Like no guitar solo? Yeah, right? What uh? What year was this? Do you think? Oh, uh, uh, we were in high school, so 70, 77, yeah, wow. all that, eighty seven or something, right? <laughs> and then you know, it, we were we didn't go into to any real hardcore shows until uh, you know seventy nine, eighty, and that's mm-hmm. when you started going to shows like the Fleetwood, wow, and that was just mind blowing, you know. I mean, you're going into like a, a dangerous environment then, and just the excitement and violence was just. You know, you could just taste it. It's yeah. mind blowing, you know. And you were like what, eighteen, yeah. seventeen? Seventeen, eighteen, about then. Wow. Oh my god. Yeah. So, as you're getting into this punk, were you into music? Like, what were you doing musically? I mean, how did you even? How did Channel Three even come about? Well, you know, we we took uh, guitar lessons like in junior high or, or high school, and so Kim and I was always get together and play guitars and try to learn how to play, you know, Rock Bottom, UFO, and Led Zeppelin, and sure, you know, you're all shitty. You're all like, God, I can never. Why, why can't I ever play this? You know, no. but then you get that Ramones record, and you're like, Holy shit, we can play this! And right, so, right. You know, Power chords. Yeah. yeah. So in high school, my, my brother was a musician, so we'd borrow his stuff and just go out in the garage and turn it up and all that, and just, just for fun. And then uh, it's funny, in, in Cerritos, there was a real like party culture. There's a band called The Hated, mm. and uh, they would play at parties. We'd go see them, and then you know we, we finally got you know five or six cover songs together, some Ramon songs and 999 songs, some Clash songs, and then we started playing some parties. Wow. And, uh, you know, that was just, just mind-blowing. As Channel 3, you guys were playing? No, we, I mean, started playing parties. It was just like Mike and Kim's band. And then we called ourselves Forcible Entry. And then uh, <laughs> and then like we that. came up with Channel 3 out of out of just thin air. You know, people always ask us the, the meaning behind it. It's like, oh, I don't know. There was no Channel 3 back then. It was right. Like, right? Yeah. Oh, so that's the reason, because there was no Channel 3. So yeah, it was, guys, it was, was like void the, to fill. you'd have to turn on the white noise channel three to like play your nintendo or yeah 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 watch oh, that's tv right. back then right yeah. the yeah. atari 2600 yeah that's like the old school that's like so the switch to channel three because there's nothing on channel three yeah. we're like we're channel three man that was a, it all right. finally makes sense yeah you know? there you go <laughs> yeah it's a very cool name so when you guys were first starting off uh like how did how did the rest of the guys how did you guys like form the rest of the band how did channel three like the original lineup first form yeah, so, you know, so Kim and I were just playing, bashing away guitars, and then, you know, we'd have friends come by with drum sets and nothing they ever took, and then we'd, we ran through just succession of drummers, you know, and back then, you... you what is it with drummers? 
What's well, the deal? I think back, especially back then, if if somebody knew how to play drums, they weren't interested in punk rock. You know, They're like yeah. let's play you know some Rush here, and guys are coming with these double kicks and like these eighteen piece sets. Like <laughs> we're trying something different here. Right. And so, you know, we were playing the parties. We'd just cycle through drummers. But our friend Larry Kelly, who was another Cerritos high guy, mm -hmm. started playing bass. And so we had, you know, the three of us were locked in. And then we finally found a drummer in Mike Burton, who was, you know, we were all just Cerritos kids, you know. Yeah. And he jumped in there. And uh, that's when we started uh, writing our own songs. And so. 1980? Uh, yeah. 1980, you know, we're, we're playing parties all the time. I, I don't know how there were parties back then. I mean, every weekend there'd be five parties. And I think back now, it's like, where were the parents, you know? Yeah, these big suburban <laughs> They were at houses. their own parties. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I guess. We were, we were a lucky generation. They were more than the kids. You know, lucky generation just to be kind of lost and doing yeah. what, whatever we wanted. Yep, yep. Yeah, seriously. Yeah. So when you're talking about uh, your first experience writing music, like, who was originally writing the songs, and how, how was what was the songwriting process like? You know, I, I I'm the one who just started bringing in. It's like, hey man, I you know I wrote this song, and mm -hmm. of course the first songs are just like straight ripoffs of whatever. I think the first song I ever wrote was "You Make Me Feel Cheap," which is the uh, duet on uh, the Fear of Life. Yeah, and, that was that and, was your guys' first song. That was the first song I ever wrote. Wow, and it's just a straight ripoff of Aerosmith's "Mama Can." <laughs> it's the same same exact chords and I just yeah, you know, wrote yeah. the words and it's funny because it was words of like a guy being like used right. for one night stand right. or whatever right. and when we recorded that that song we we did it we finished that Fear of Life record it's funny we walked walked out of the studio it's great and then uh, the next week uh, Robbie Fields Posh Boy said, hey, tune in to Rodney tonight. He's going to play this song. Nice. And he played it, and there's a woman's voice on there. We're like, what? And they went in afterwards, Rodney and his girlfriend, Maria. Shut up. And they said, you know what would be good? A woman's voice. And they went in there and tracked it without telling us. So and at it, that point, you were working with Posh Boy. Yeah. Okay. And you that was a little bit that. later. So yeah, yeah, yeah. just backtracking, though, that, that shows the process. You know, we, we wrote a song that was, you know, straight ripoff. It, it was recorded. And then... The producers back then, and the glory days of producers being Svengali, said, right. we know what to do. We don't need to tell the band this. Yeah. They're, it's just the band. Who cares about those guys? Yeah, we were so pissed off. We're like, hey, man, that's not what we did. But then Rodney started playing at every single show oh, because yeah. he was going out with yeah. Maria. And we're like, oh. And then you're like, yeah, that was our yeah. idea. Yeah, we totally did that. That's well, fine. His girlfriend. <laughs> So what what were things like after that song came out on the comp? Because I'm sure you guys got some more exposure after people started hearing that song on the comp. Yeah, um, you, you know when we had enough uh, originals, we just went in and made a demo tape and uh, just kind of like just to make a demo tape, see how it sounded in right. the studio. And you was... you re-released that demo originally. Or yeah, originally, uh, right? TKO put the, that out years later. I don't know why anybody be interested in it because it's it... awesome. Yeah. Duh. <laughs> <laughs> It is but, awesome. Not kidding about it being awesome. It's good. But that demo tape actually made its way through friends to a girl that was going out with Robbie, and they listened to it on on some drive to Palm Springs, and he came back and he contacted us. By that time, we'd never even played a show, wow. a real gig. It was just still playing Damn. parties. That's a good way to start. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it just like in one of those funny old movies, you know, he came and sat on my mom's washing machine in the garage and listened to us play the set, and he pulled a contract out of a briefcase, and we're like, Come on. That, no that way. Cliche is this. We're like, okay, we're signing it. Yeah. Well, how old were you when this happened? Uh, 18. Okay. So you're yeah. like, any contract? Yeah. yeah. Of course. We'll sign our lives away. I, what I love to hear about these old stories is, you know, all you old school guys have these stories where your parents are involved. You know, yeah, they came over to my parents' house and sat in the living room and yeah. talked to my parents and talked them into going, letting us go on tour and yada, yada, yada. And it's yeah. like fucking amazing. Is that know? funny? I mean, my mom, God bless her, let, her pra let us practice in that garage that wasn't soundproof and just shook the house. But every night at eight, she, she said, cool it. that's it, guys. Come on in, have some dinner. And Oh, know. she had dinner waiting too? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, your mom sounds awesome. <laughs> so Robbie came over and gave us a contract. And we actually said, wait a second. We're going to have our lawyers look at this. Because we I had a brother-in-law that's working for a law firm. Oh, shit. So they looked at it and said, well, who are these guys? They're like, oh, that's my, you know, my friend's band in the garage. It's like, well... What this guy's doing is he's taking all your publishing, but you know these guys aren't. Yeah, you know, I mean rock and roll. You guys aren't going to be around in a couple of years, right? And it's like just sign it. Go ahead. He's going to make a record. And we're like, you're going to make a record, record, a record we can hold, right? He's yeah. Do it. Okay, we signed it. Yeah. 
So do you guys regret not having your publishing at this point? Yeah, Looking you know, back? that that's a thing when we get into the Posh Boy thing is he had the foresight to sign the publishing deal. And, you know, back then people didn't really think about that. Right, right. And you're thinking, it's like, well, what's going to happen in 30 years? There's be some magic uh, new thing that they can, yeah. you know, stream things through their area. Come on now. And, you know, sure enough, right, right. those songs are be, have become valuable because, you know, there's just so much content. Yeah. Netflix yeah. and everything. And yeah. They're always looking for background. And for sure. You, you, you see these these commercials now and you hear that punk rock it's like you know what because our generation has grown up and these yeah. guys are working in the advertising agency and all that and they say I know a perfect song for this right yeah you're watching Stranger yeah. Things and the Ill Repute song comes on and you're right. like whoa what the Right. That's just right. Yep. So on one one side, you know, I talked to a lot of bands that did that and, you know, signed away the publishing. And uh, I used to talk to Steve Soto about this a lot. He said, you know what? If you hadn't signed with Poshway, where would you guys be? Yeah. You guys would be been that band that played in the garage and maybe played one Cougar's Nest and that was it. Yeah. And he took you somewhere. And of all the bands, I think we have the most uh, songs on his catalogs. And we actually are still in contact with him and he still, you know, gives us accounting. So wow. it, it's worked out fine for That's us. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to ask you, what was the experience like being on Posh Boy Records? Like overall? Well, it's fantastic. I mean, you know, going back, so we, we made the demo and we, we were, he sent us into the studio and we recorded that EP in, you know, six hours and we had still not even played a gig. And so our first show was a, a Cuckoo's Nest Wednesday night audition night, you know, and he came down, and you know, we were just, yeah, you know, we'd never been on a stage. We'd only played backyards and all that, and yeah. and uh, we went up there and we played, you know, just nervous as hell at the cuckoo's nest. And by the next week, that record was in Zed Records, and at that point, Posh Boys, you know, track record was uh, the Rodney and the Rocks mm-hmm. compilations, yep. Beach Boulevard, and the T.S. Well EP was right before us. And so we were the next EP, and people were just like, whoa, you know, this. Record label's on fire. Right, right. On, you guys yeah. got put into good positions. Yeah. On that and label. so we yeah. were immediately just cast into like, okay, you guys are the punk rock band now. Wow. That is awesome. What were like, so after that happened, what were some of the bigger shows you started playing? Well, you know, the back then, those Olympic auditorium shows, yeah. I mean, just, you know, mind blowing. You know, 3,000 seats. You know, we played in Florentine Gardens with professionals. And, wow. you know, I mean, I look back at those flyers and I just can't believe the lineups, yeah. right? Uh, always, they're like historic, yeah. yeah. The history behind those flyers. And of course, at the time, we're like, what? Do we have a show this week? Like, yeah, it's like playing with some band called The Exploited and, you know, yeah. GBH. We're like, all right, you know, where do we go? Is there a beer? That kind of thing. Uh, so early on after Posh Boy uh, came out and you started getting these bigger shows, were you guys going on tour at all? Yeah, I think our first tour. Uh, well, you know, in Southern California, you'd go up to San Francisco, yeah. and then you'd go out to Phoenix, and, you know, maybe Las Vegas. Vegas. And, you know, you, you get in a van for like five hours to go somewhere else. So yeah. then we, I think it was 81, was the first tour that we went to uh, through Texas. And that first tour was with Husker Du and the Big Boys, oh, wow. <laughs> which was insane, right? Yeah, wow. And uh, we got to be really close friends with the Big Boys in, in Austin, so, you know, that's forever has stayed one of our favorite places. But I, I think that first tour was just like, you know, 10 days. We made it as far as New Orleans and came back. Yes. But, uh, you know, back then, you know, there's no cell phones and there's no Internet. Yeah. And uh, we just had stolen calling cards that you'd yeah. stop at a <laughs> payphone. Calling cards, yeah. yeah. But it was uh, Chuck Dukowski from Black Flag who, who was just, you know, Kim would call him and he'd say, OK, you're, go here, go here, call this guy. Call that guy. That helps. Yeah, this guy's cool. got this guy's mom's got a big house she can sleep in, you know. Wow. And it was really an underground network, and people really coming together to help each other. Oh, then. That's awesome. Wow. So uh, we did that, and then uh, we went to the East Coast the following winter. Where I think we're going to '82, and uh, uh, Poshboy had set up a tour with Blitz in England, oh, wow. and so he just sent us the tickets. Said, you know, land JFK chats were there, and the day before Blitz broke up. And so we're like, well, now what do we do? They said, well, you have a New Year's Eve show at, uh, I don't know where, Irving Plaza in New York City. And we're like, what do we do? And they said, he says, go. So we went with one-way tickets to New York. We played. And they were like, now what do we do? And we were staying with uh, Doug from Kraut and Jack from the Big Takeover magazine. And he said, well, you want to play at CBGB's? And we're like, oh, okay. And so we go Sweet. and... 
Wow. Played CBGB's. There was a club called A7, and we'd play there every night, late night. And then New York, right? Yeah. And so we're on the East Coast, and we were there for two and a half weeks. And they're like, well, get a car and you can play Boston. So we'd play Boston. We played Philadelphia, DC. And it wow. blew our minds because on the East Coast, you know, yeah. in two hours, you're in a totally different market in a historic city. Right, right. And our minds were just blown. So that first tour, we probably played at CBGB's six times. <laughs> You know, yeah. UK subs came into town. We played with them like, you know, they they do a show and they clear the room, do a late show. Yeah, yeah right. You know, the, 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 you know, and so we were like, we're, we got to move to New York, man. Where were you guys staying? Just people just, you up? just just uh, we were based at uh, Jack's place, Lower East Side, which was uh, back then, you know, just a terrible, terrible neighborhood. I mean, fun, fun and dangerous. Right, right. You go now and it's like, you know, New York City's all cleaned up. But back then it was like Sketchy. really scary. Nice. But, uh, you know, that first trip, we met all the guys from Beastie Boys and the guys from Bad Brains and Adrenal OD. And, you know, wow, we, shit. Front. Yeah. yeah. And they're, right. they're, everyone was just kids, you know, and just supporting each other. It was great. That's yeah. awesome, man. Yeah. So I'm going to jump ahead a little bit here. So when you guys put out the album Last Time I Drank, <laughs> now they're, oh, he's already, you're already laughing about it. I wasn't going to talk shit. I was just going to say, uh, there's, I like the album too. I think it, it sounds uh, it sounds like a little bit more polished, and it's oh, definitely yeah. more of like a rock and roll sound. Oh yeah, um, it's probably one of those things where like a little after after a while, maybe the fans didn't like it as much. But you know, you listen to it now, and I'm like, it's still it's a pretty good album. I still really like it. You know, this is timely because Ron Gowdy, the producer, just passed away yesterday. No oh, way. And so there's a lot of memories of his days. He's the one who kind of oversaw the TSL change over as well mm, as us. okay okay yeah so that was like around the same time right yeah like a lot of bands were, were kind of switching their sound up around that yeah time. Uh, you know around that time i tried to explain to people it's like punk rock was just like really dire straits i mean you know it was like mid 80s by this time and mm -hmm. it seemed like a whole lifetime but every show was just a riot and the violence was yeah. just overwhelming mm -hmm. and we we're just kind of like what are we doing this for yeah and so um you know, we, we had fulfilled our contract with Posh Boy. We're looking around, and Enigma was kind of like taking over all these, you know, you know, shattered punk rock bands. Like, oh, God, now what do we Crossing do? Crossing them over. So yeah. yeah. And uh, I think the, the thing was that, you know, we'd kind of evolved in our writing. We've always written melodic things, but yeah. they said, you know, we're going to produce this like a big-time record, which I think the production on that record is something that throws people off. Yeah. But, I like know, it. I, I like the production. Oh, I, I mean, we still play those songs, you know? Yeah. I mean, I know some bands, they're like, they don't even want to talk about those those days. But we're like, we had a blast, man. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, you went from Posh Boy to Enigma, you know, and the, obviously producing is such a difference. Can you oh, talk yeah. about the, how the differences were and, I mean, the production value and just how you felt about it? Yeah. Um, you know, the last time I drank, I think we, we spent three months making that record. Wow. Just because it was just, you know, they just – said we still have time you know so we wow. we recorded the drums with uh uh i don't know some big room in hollywood and then we moved over to mad dog studios in uh, venice and we we're just kind of going in there just like you know laying one guitar line down and then going and getting drunk and then show up the next day you know just Awful cliche rock star stuff. <laughs> yeah, milk in that studio. Time. But actually, the last Posh Boy thing, the the after lights go out, we did that at Gold Star Studios and you know Gold Star, which is like where the Beach Boys and Phil Spector did all that. Oh wow! And I don't know yeah. how Posh Boy swung that, but we were in there with Stan Ross, who was the engineer on all those huge hits, yeah. and we were walking around like you know the the wall of sound room and all that kind right. of stuff. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that must have been crazy. You guys yeah. must have been like, oh, dude, we're rock stars now. But, you know, I think the last time I drank thing kind of showed us, like, you know, more is not always more. You know, it's, it's kind of like we've learned that, you know, if, if this song is going to swing in the studio, just get it down mm -hmm. and move on. And you don't have to spend, you know, two days trying to get that snare sound, right? Right, yeah. I mean, you remember yeah. the 80s, it, the snare had to sound like a shotgun going yeah, off like in the hall. Like the super reverb. Is <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we would seriously spend two days, you know, they put triggers on every drum, and then it's like, blam, blam. I'm like, oh, my God. Uh, <laughs> you know? well, that was like, the sound, though. Yeah. So you guys record that album. It comes out. What's going on then at that point? Uh, you know, at that time, you know, you're still touring as Channel 3, and so when you go on the road... I think in L.A., you know, everyone was kind of like, you know, club lingerie and playing the Roxy and, and all the punkers that had survived had kind of like 
like, all right, you know, it's getting sleazier and all that. But you'd go on, on the road, and there's still punk rockers, you know, and they come out and see you play, and all of a sudden, you know, you pull out a harmonica, and, you know, you got big hair, like, fuck you guys, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I can understand you feel betrayed, right? Yeah. But at the same time, we were like, look, man, we, you know, we're not going to just stay in that box and play for, you know, yeah. 14 year old boys and, you know, for bunch of guys of that want to kill yeah. us, you know, we want to get some chicks, man. <laughs> you know, it's so that's the reason. <laughs> yeah, yeah, chicks. exactly. Yeah. Okay, moving up. But like for me, you know, obviously I'm, I'm younger. And so I, I was more of the guy looking at some of my favorite bands like you guys and right. later in the late eighties, hoping they'd play the old stuff. And they, you know, they evolved at that point. Yeah. And, um, but then you later appreciate the new stuff. Like, I really appreciate that album. I was actually listening to it this morning. And, you know, and I think for me, even getting older, you know, just feeling the way I feel about a lot of these music, maybe that I wasn't into in the late 80s, but with my favorite bands, you know, and a lot of these bands coming back later and playing all the old stuff and the newer stuff that they sure. played. I think it's awesome, man. You know, I think everyone just evolves. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's crazy because, you know, we've, we're coming up on, how many years? 40 years or something yeah, as a that's, band? That's crazy, yeah. And Damn. we've recorded the whole time. So, you know, if you put down our whole catalog of, you know, 100 songs and all that, how do you pick a set list? Yeah. And it's like, well, you know what? When I go see a band, it's like I'm as guilty as everyone. I want to hear those first two records, right? Yeah, right. So we got to do those. They're like, well, we got a new song, you know? And so we'll, we'll just kind of rotate some of those other songs in now and then. And you see who who responds to it. But, <laughs> you know, I think as a classic act, you're, you're stuck playing that first DP in yeah. Fear of Life forever. So be it, man. So be it. I mean, yeah. at least there's people that, you know, still like to hear the music, you know, all these years later. Yeah. I think it counts for something. Well, it's insane. I was just talking to the guys in, you know, D. Cry and Shatter Faith and Youth Brigade last night. It's like are we allowed to do this forever? And maybe so, you know. I mean, it I punk rock's become – kind of like the blues in that you know you don't think twice if you see a 75 year old guy up yeah. there shredding the blues but right a hair band you know you're like oh you know they can't quite fit in the spandex anymore yeah. those poor guys it looks but, a little sketchy yeah, yeah. but it's because punk rock was the anti-image thing and all mm -hmm. that it's like look man you know we can be ugly whatever and still do it and ugly ugly is ugly no matter how old you are you know what i mean and it's it's amazing that you know these i mean there were kids just tiny toddlers with headphones on last night and then yeah. grandpa was there yeah. and all it, that that's awesome yeah. yeah it's really interesting too because like yeah you got you guys it could be 70 playing this stuff as long yeah. as you guys can play it you know and you know maybe you only have a couple original guys that are still around but still playing and cranking out you people are always going to go i'll be 60 going to these shows you know what i mean oh i you know and then younger kids will be playing it and it's just like yeah i don't see it going away honestly i i I don't see it going anywhere. Well, we were so fortunate to be there pretty much at the at the birth of a, a whole music thing. I mean, this and rap, you know, in our lifetimes. Yeah. That's mind-blowing. And I think that's what makes the, the fan base so loyal to it, you know. People are, are really possessive punk rock. It's like, this was our music. Yeah. We were a small community. You had to work to be a punk rocker, you know. Right. And God damn if I'll give it up. You know? And I think that's also why people tend to like the old stuff, because that was, like, at the inception of, like, Channel 3. That was, like, their first exposure to Channel right. 3. So it's yeah. gonna, it, they're going to have more of an emotional connection to it. Yeah. But as far as your emotional connection to some of your songs – now, are there any songs that, like, you play for the fans, but you just hate playing live? <laughs> uh, not that we hate playing live, but you kind of go on automatic pilot, you know? Right. I mean, we played Got a Gun probably, you know, two million times, you know? It's always our last song, and I'm kind of like, I'm already thinking about what's for dinner when we're playing that song. It's like, all right, like, oh, now we're now checked we're out. Gonna, we're after our encore. Big surprise, we're going to play this song. Ooh, you guys are yeah. all surprised. Well, you know, you're just stuck with some songs you have to play every night. And it's like, you know... Of course, you know we love all the songs, but sure. but we They're do. Like your children, you we do have some do. songs that that are like you know you really look forward to playing the set. What, yeah, what are those ones? What are the songs that you really? Well, it's love funny. Playing? So didn't know, which is like when the slower songs mm -hmm. enough lights go on, yeah. and a, a very melodic, almost a new wave song. And uh, we we put that down in the studio. And when Robbie came in, he said that's the hit. And he, next day we walked in, and there was these three old bald guys around the microphone we're like who are these guys he's like these are professional singers professional jingle singers wow. wow and they they just walked in they just nailed like every uh harmony and all that oohs and ahs yeah. and they're they're ba -da -da -da. And it was all over that track and and i was like i just furious <laughs> and we had a, we had a real 
like negotiation. So he kept some of that stuff at the very end. You hear this stuff, but it really sweetened it up. And so the record came out and we're like, we're going to get killed for this track. And then we wouldn't play it for years because it would just slow down the momentum of yeah, the pit, whatever. Yeah. But now we play it and like we can see people just love it. You know, just have all the backup singers in the background live. <laughs> we like, should. Chorus of everybody. Yeah. But people really like the song, you know, when we play it live even, you know. Yeah. And it's got some dynamics, so by the end it's cranking. But, you know, For it's, sure. yeah, yeah. you know. So um, you guys were pretty consistent as a band throughout the 80s. Was there any breakups? And if there were, can you talk about what caused it and, you know. Yeah, I think there was a little bit of a break. It's kind of a, like a resetting of it. So the, the final uh, lineup there, when it was Jay Lansford of, of the Simple Tones, and uh, Mike Dimkich uh, was playing bass, and then Kim. He's in. He's in like another band, right? Oh yeah. So so we got to a point where it was just kind of like you know what? It's it's it just kind of wasn't fun anymore. We're just sure. in that demo hell. We're just doing demos for record companies for a time. Tr- everyone trying to get a major label. So we just stopped uh, playing. So Jay went to a band called The Unforgiven, big guitar band. Uh, Mike Mike went and became a sideman for the Cult. And uh, Kim started a glam band called Bulldog, and I was in a band called Stagger Lee. And so everyone kept in music, but we all kind of separated. Sure. And then uh, uh, Jay ended up moving to Germany, hmm. which he, you know, full European day loves it. Uh, Mike, after the cult, is now in Bad Religion, doing great. I've heard of them. Yeah. Um, and then Kim and I, uh, after a while, we, we started like just getting together in the garage with, you know, a couple guys. And actually, the, the original guys, Larry and Mike, and we just started playing the old songs again, oh, just yeah. for ourselves, Sweet. you know. And we started doing that and just just without thoughts of playing. Now, is this the same garage where you guys shot the history music video? That was actually my mom's garage that we started in. Oh, okay. Although that was, I think, off limits by then, you know. We'd all moved out by then. <laughs> So uh, we uh, we were playing just for, just for the to hear you know the loud guitars you know yeah. you know every, every, everyone gets older and you get married you have a kid and you start thinking about making your money and it's like mm. you just you just want to feel those those amplifiers behind you yeah. you know just buzzing and come home with it ringing ears and that, we just found that love for it again. What year is this? We're now we're into like 1990 you know okay. 90 or so and. Uh, then we started doing uh, once a year. We'd play at the Doll Hut for Linda's uh, uh, benefits for the children's home, and we were just blown away by it. people would come out and you know they knew, they knew the old songs and all that. And we're like, wow, this is great. And then you know, then the internet popped up, and every band in Southern California got back together. It seemed like, yeah. and was playing, and everyone still plays now, and it's amazing. Yeah. Not not just phoning it in. I mean, everyone's like out there touring and you know sounding better than ever and recording again. And uh, I think you know the internet, for better or worse, you know made that music accessible, accessible to everybody. Yeah, yep. And uh, you know these festivals started popping up, and all of a sudden, you know, you get to play at the House of Blues. It's like there's actually a bathroom in here. You know, there. <laughs> who's this food for? What us? What? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> More than it goes beyond just drink tickets. Yeah, <laughs> it's it, it, it's amazing. So I mean, the it's whole cool. resurgence of, of punk rock has just been so you know just gratifying. Just so you know, it humbles us. There was such still a hunger for it, it right? though. You know what I mean? Yeah. In the nineties, it's like all the bands kind of separated. They weren't really doing much. Right. You know, and that's when I got into it. And then when you guys came back in late nineties, early two thousands, playing all you know a lot of bands were playing the old stuff. I mean, yeah. everyone was eating that up. I think it was a perfect time. Well, you know, I know a lot of the old guys, they, they hold a grudge against Blink-182 and Green Day and all that for, like, you know, that pop punk. But I'll tell you what, man, it's like for every kid that got into Green Day, they want, they wanted to find out where that came from. And so they Absolutely. went and bought a Stiff Little Fingers record, yep. and then they yeah. found, what's more hardcore than this? And next thing you know, yep. you know, they got a Channel 3 su- patch. Yeah. It's like, great. I bet you'd be surprised how many of those kids who started on Blink-182 eventually became Channel 3 fans. Oh, yeah. It's, it's fantastic. Yeah. And what's really crazy is, you know, we, we get to play shows with, you know, the guys in Rancid and all that. And they just, oh, yeah. there's like, Channel 3, you know, much respect. Fantastic. Oh, yeah. 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 Well, like I said, you guys were there at the inception. You guys were one yeah. of those first 
I, you know, you know big punk rock fans. if so. nothing else, if you stay alive and you survive, you know, you eventually get some sort of respect for it, right? <laughs> <laughs> All right, Mike, what's next for Channel 3? Uh, we're actually heading up uh, north to uh, Pacific Northwest next weekend with our buddies in Chatter Faith. Oh, okay. We have a show uh, in Tacoma on Friday, January 31st, and then we're in Portland February 1st. And then, uh, let's see, I think Kim and I are doing an acoustic show, our first ever in really? Fullerton. Yeah. Oh, cool. And then uh, we're going to help uh, TSL ring in their 40-year anniversary Jeez. with a show at the Viper Room on, in March. And then okay. we're heading to, back to Europe in uh, the summer. Nice. Yeah, so you guys are right? as active as ever. Yeah. Yeah. We, we like to give the, the illusion of momentum, you know, we're, like we, we keep going. <laughs> yeah. Don't yeah. stop, man. Don't stop. Yeah. Is there anything else that you'd like to add? When we, no. When we I mean, uh, you know, good luck with this endeavor, man. It's it's really high high time that somebody had a OC-based podcast and all that. It's such a rich history, you know. Yeah. So good well, luck we, with that. We love the conversations, and thank you very much. Absolutely. All right, guys. So if you want to hear more of the podcast, make sure that you subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher Radio, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you like watching the video versions, make sure you stay subscribed to our YouTube channel where you can find it. Whenever we have a new episode, you guys will be notified. So um, my name is Jeff Eric, and you guys can find me on the usual social media channels. I'm Stan Mueller. Thanks for listening, watching, and, you know, we're going to keep going. Thank you, Mike, so much. It was my so pleasure. awesome having you here. All right, guys, we'll see you next time. Thank you so much. All right, see ya.